My name is uh, Pier Giorgio Cipriano. I'm working uh, at uh, Teda Group Public Services, an ICT uh, Italian based company. And now I'm uh, presenting you uh, the, the Smash platform uh, that is a, a two years project we are uh, working on. Uh, Smash stands for Sustainable Mobility Analysis as Service Hub. And the objective is uh, to provide a platform uh, to basically to data owners in order to support them in uh, extracting value from uh, their own uh, raw data about urban mobility and make this value available to all uh, relevant stakeholders through the implementation of uh, interoperable web services. Indeed, uh, uh, with the urban mobility raw data, we mean data about uh, uh, where, when, and how people move in the city. So basically dynamic data. A Smash platform is being developed uh, during uh, this year and next year with the support of uh, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology uh, Climate Kick. And the consortium uh, that we are leading is composed by the members that are listed here. We are uh, spending a lot of time during this year to actively involve uh, different data providers uh, from the countries that are represented, uh, coming from mobility and transport agencies, data analysts, and final users to uh, define together what data are available in order to uh, implement uh, analytic scenarios uh, that, uh, that can be useful for them. So transport, uh, as we know, represents uh, uh, quite a uh, big share of uh, the European uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission with uh, almost three quarters uh, caused by road transport. And local authorities all over Europe, and not only, of course, all, uh, in, in Europe, uh, uh, together with public transport uh, companies, are called to play uh, an important role, a crucial role, in delivering uh, uh, solutions to mitigate uh, uh, this big problem uh, by encouraging, uh, first of all, uh, active traveling, so cycling and walking, the usage of, of public transport, the usage of uh, sharing and pooling schemes for bikes and cars. And uh, to that, uh, it is important, extremely important, uh, to have uh, a timely access uh, to raw data, but also to integrate data coming from different sources and to provide a good interpretation of them. Transport, we know, uh, is one of the sectors where uh, uh, there is a, an exponential uh, increase of uh, numbers of people and things, vehicles that are uh, daily connected uh, with some estimations that can be found uh, uh, from different sources about uh, numbers of uh, users of car sharing services or numbers of people, of persons that daily, every day move uh, using public transport. And all these data have got uh, uh, two important dimensions. On one end, uh, the spatial dimension. On the other one, the time dimension. Data coming from uh, smartphone mobile, mobile apps data coming from uh, fleet management systems, so from uh, FOM systems that are usually installed uh, on, uh, on vehicles, uh, as well as GPS uh, systems uh, equipped on uh, um, car or bike share, uh, sharing services, traffic sensors, environmental sensors. Even though these data uh, are potentially available actual data about the real usage of public transport, cycling and walking and car sharing uh, are scattered at, uh, among different sources. And uh, more important, such data usually vary a lot in scope, formats and quality and uh, many times cannot be also geolocated. Indeed, uh, urban mobility data f from our own perspective has to be seen as a raw ingredients to feed uh, the urban transition uh, in this century uh, based on the integration of uh, heterogeneous data. So going to uh, some examples uh, we are already working on in the SMASH project. Uh, starting from uh, uh, these numbers, in uh, Bologna, since last year, the municipality launched a behavioral change campaign 
to promote uh, the uh, active, the so-called uh, active traveling, so to, uh, to, to, to make some uh, incentives to, to people to use not only public transport, but to use bike and, 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 uh, and go uh, by walking. Uh, they uh, involved uh, Better Points, a UK uh, small company uh, that is also partnering with us uh, in uh, Smash to provide free of charge this uh, uh, mobile app that uh, last year, during the six months of behavioral change campaign, was used by more than uh, 1,500 uh, persons. And just uh, focusing on, uh, on bike, uh, they collected uh, more than uh, they traveled more than one million kilometers, so collecting uh, something about uh, 733 uh, million of GPS waypoints, only considering bikes. What we did is to use this data as input data to provide back uh, uh, not only interactive uh, maps uh, uh, with the time evolution segment by segment, but also for providing uh, uh, downloading services to make uh, accessible to them uh, the uh, resulting analytics and to, so, to facilitate uh, the monitoring of uh, cycle, cycle uh, path usages. So in this uh, um, animated map, uh, we can see a, a very uh, simple example of uh, uh, road segments of the uh, network in, in Bologna where with uh, the time evolution every six hours in terms of uh, number of counts, counts uh, of uh, bikes, uh, of bikers that use the, the Better Points uh, app. So basically, with Smash, uh, we want to uh, provide answer to the needs uh, of local authorities, but also transport agencies and private companies about accessibility, monitoring, planning, and optimization of uh, uh, urban mobility. This is another example in Zagreb. We took uh, the data coming from uh, a, a challenge uh, launched some years ago, the European Cycling Challenge, with one uh, month uh, of data, uh, again, coming from bikers, uh, to estimate, uh, as uh, requested by the municipality of Zagreb, uh, uh, the, to, to estimate the number of arrivals at a specific uh, stops but also when talking about public transport, uh, uh, the idea is to use uh, these raw ingredients, these raw data, basically GPS waypoints to explore not only public transport network and scheduled trips, but also to compare the difference between the scheduled service versus the actual uh, service. So to identify systematic delays and also to uh, be uh, also to, to allow the job coding of uh, the e ticket, the electronic ticket, ticket validation. So, considering uh, uh, the usages and types of, uh, of, uh, of ticket here, there is a, a screenshot and another an animated uh, map showing uh, in Reggio Emilia in, um, in Italy where and when people validate uh, their own uh, um, electronic tickets. Uh, the legend classifies them uh, in terms of typology of, uh, of tickets. We did also some uh, experiments, uh, uh, some prototypes uh, uh, using uh, uh, data, raw data provided by some car sharing service operators, uh, in this case, uh, to identify how demand changes uh, over time and where, of course, and to identify the most used uh, uh, roads and um, the um, origin destination. In this case, we were asked to, uh, to, to identify, in terms of sales, the car sharing pickups, uh, considering a time evolution uh, with the time slots of uh, four hours. About local administration, uh, one of the, as mentioned before, one of the uh, main requests that local administrations uh, demonstrated is to measure also the, uh, the, the results of the behavioral change campaigns that usually are, uh, are launched. 
Uh, so means, this means to measure also the accessibility uh, by different modes of transport, uh, the, uh, the identification of the main access uh, and taxi routes, uh, uh, the areas with the safety concerns for uh, bikers, and this uh, can, be done, can be done again by leveraging on the usage of uh, mobile apps. So this is another one uh, uh, implemented by Fondazione Bruno Kessler, partnering also in Smash Project, similar to the previous one. Uh, allowing us to create some uh, simple dashboards like this one, where we can uh, see uh, how the uh, usage of uh, 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 how citizens work uh, uh, along uh, the, uh, the the different days. In this case, uh, of uh, the um, campaigns, the, the last campaigns was launched in October last year and finished in uh, March. No, sorry, in May this year. A new one will be launched. Uh, in October this year. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the dashboard that we uh, were requested uh, um, aims, aims at uh, providing information also in terms of uh, um, browsable diagrams uh, uh, with different types of uh, modes of, of moving uh, uh, public transport, walking and bike, basically. The key elements of the platform are basically summarized in this uh, uh, in, in this um, uh, slide, so the platform has to be is conceived uh, as a standard based uh, uh, list of uh, uh, web services to be offered uh, as a uh, software as a service to ingest, to view, to access and download, and to process data. Uh, of course, we focus also on uh, interoperability about uh, data and semantics, looking at uh, what inspire, in particular, transport network uh, um, uh, promotes uh, OSM and GTFS uh, as basic standard already used for input and output. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, considering a future implementation in terms of uh, interoperability uh, towards uh, NetExt, uh, Siri, and Opera uh, standards. And here in these uh, two uh, final slides, uh, uh, we have just depicted uh, the uh, data model that has been in implemented, where to ingest and process uh, uh, dynamic data about uh, public transport and uh, about uh, other types of, um, of transport in, a, in a, a normal context. Here we have uh, the contacts. You have um, contacts uh, uh, and names uh, of the partners uh, involved in, in, um, uh, in the project. And here the network, uh, basically municipalities, uh, but also mobility agencies and transport uh, authorities. Uh, I remember that uh, this is a project uh, supported uh, and co-funded by Climate Kick, that is uh, one of the knowledge innovation communities of the European Institute of uh, Innovation and Technology. And thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to talk about the project called Polyviso. In the first half of the presentation, I will introduce you to the key concept behind the project, why we introduced it, what we are trying to achieve, who is testing the concept, and then I'm, try, I'm trying to make a transition to, to um, Inspire and specifically the, the metadata uh, aspect of Inspire, which I think is also at the heart of this event that is taking place right now. Polyviso, when you hear the term, probably an image like this will come up, uh, something uh, of a cross between policy and visualization, and that conveys the essence of the project, but only partially. What we're actually trying to achieve is a bit more than that. We want to create a framework, a, a data-driven framework that cities can use to implement better mobility policies, because we know that policy making can be a long and laborious process. 
that sometimes fails to keep up with realities of everyday life. And when we were conceiving Polyvizu, we had a few good examples to learn from, or should I say bad examples. Take Kyoto Protocol, for example. Uh, despite um, uh, setting out uh, greenhouse emission targets uh, over 10 years ago, cities like Paris still continue to suffer the, you know, the highest CO2 uh, pollution today. Um, you can argue that there are many reasons why Kyoto failed. Is it because the US didn't sign up, China or, in, or India didn't sign up, but there were also some inherent institutional failures in the way the policy was designed. Um, there was meant to be a five-year implementation period, um, only 10 years uh, after it was signed. And also the targets that were set were unambitious, very binding, that stifled experimentation and uh, innovation at a time when uh, good practices in greenhouse gas emissions were not really developed. But if you want another example uh, of a general policy that uh, is still failing largely, you can think of congestion, for example. Um, as a uh, uh, previous speaker said, uh, transport contributes a lot to CO2 emissions. Uh, it affects uh, our health, the environment, not to mention the time wasted uh, when we spend too much uh, time in traffic. And there were various um, policy options introduced to address the issue, from congestion charge to building new roads. But in London, for example, where on one hand, congestion charge helped reduce traffic. Uh, at the same time, it led to the increase of private rented vehicles like Uber, who are exempt from, uh, from uh, congestion charge. Uh, or if you consider another option, building more roads, there are some examples uh, that this particular approach isn't very effective either, because if you build a new road, uh, a new road that is supposed to, supposedly uh, uh, shorter than the other two or three, it will start being used by all the drivers in the area and soon will be as gridlocked, as clogged up as, as the other ones. So, um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with this situation? We live in, a, in an age, in the fourth industrial revolution uh, that um, raises certain expectations, expectations that governments will be more nimble, more responsive to challenges uh, that to a large extent are driven by technological pro uh, progress. And we in Polyviz, we believe uh, that we need data-driven solutions to challenges like, uh, like congestion, for example. And in our project, we have uh, two main aspects. One is the conceptual, uh, which is what is shown on this slide. And here, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, take stock of available city data I figure out whether it's open, closed, big or small, is it social media data, sensor data, historic data, or real-time data. Uh, put it through a number of different data analytics tools and embed this data-driven approach into the policy-making cycle, which generally consists of three steps, design, implementation, and evaluation. And now I'm going to tell you who are the guinea pigs in our project. Who, in other words, who are the cities testing the framework. Unfortunately, Antwerp is not one of them, but we have Ghent. And um, they were given free, um, free option to choose the uh, area within mobility and urban development that, like to, that they would like to focus on in the project. And Ghent chose an interesting area, which is student mobility. Because the, the going theory is, at least within uh, our Ghent colleagues, is that um, student, um, student whereabouts, student locations, uh, and, and their residences can drive up prices in the housing market, crowding out local populations, uh, which of course is, uh, is, is a negative effect. So they would like to know how student mobility and, and the whereabouts affect local populations specifically, uh, whether there is an effect on, on housing market and how their travel patterns uh, affect local services. Um, is there an increase uh, in, um, in bars and pubs and clubs along the routes that uh, cities travel? So these are the sort of things that um, the Ghent pilot is exploring. 
We have another pilot in, in Paris. Le Moulinot is one of the suburbs there. And their focus is more strictly focused on transport and mobility. Those of you who live, work, or recently came from Paris may know that they are building uh, Grand Paris Express. Uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, extension to the metro line, uh, which inevitably will affect the mobility and, and traffic pattern and in the whole region and, and specifically in Isle Moulineau. And therefore, the pilot would like to A, get the reliable data uh, that, so that it can model the impact of this, uh, of this new. Uh, a new, new construction uh, that's uh, taking place on um, travel patterns of uh, citizens living in Isle Molino and also citizens coming to and from uh, the suburb. The, um, the thing with Isle Molino and Ghent is that they are still um, trying to identify relevant data sets. For example, in the case of Isle Molino, uh, the data that the pilot is going to need is, is in private hands. So we, we couldn't really play with any visualizations, but the, uh, but the pilot that I'm going to introduce next, uh, the, the Czech pilot, the city of Pilsen, um, they have um, data and we were able to play with some visualizations, which I'm going to show in the next slide. But the, the key challenge in Pilsen is that they are building a new tram line, uh, also adding a new bus and train terminal, and there are lots of construction works taking place in the area. And of course, uh, this will also affect the mobility in the area, and the city administration wants to know how, how this will affect um, travel patterns of, of the commuters. And one of the data that uh, the city of Pearson was able to look at and investigate in more detail is the traffic accident data, and here on this slide you can see uh, traffic accidents which were collected for the past five years, so it's historic data. And uh, uh, the tool that we use to visualize this data is one of the open source solutions that we are using in this project. It's called WebGLayer. Another kind of data that Pilsen was able to, to get, thanks to its uh, sensors, it's, it's this uh, traffic information. So, for example, um, the uh, green, yellow, red segments on the road are the different traffic intensities, uh, where a red obviously represents basically a congestion, whereas uh, green is, is, is a relatively spacious road. And uh, Pilsen has got over 100, 100 of sensors, and, and we collected this data in the past uh, three months, and the total, total number of um, crossings between the roads registered, but all this by all the sensors is in the region of uh, 50 million, so it's, uh, it's quite big, and enabled us to produce this uh, really nice visualizations. And we were extremely happy to, to find out that the, the uh, word about what we were doing in the project spread to other cities, and we already registered interest from two other uh, Belgian cities, Kortrijk and Mechelen. Uh, in Kortrijk, the situation is as follows. They have um, off-street parking data, which is open data and available publicly, whereas on-street data, uh, I believe it's in, in, in the private hands. And the city naturally want to combine this data to see uh, the bigger picture, a more complete picture. And I was told that Kortrijk is competing with Lille as a shopping destination, therefore, uh, creating better parking conditions uh, was uh, one of the means of attracting more, uh, more um, people from Lille to, to Kortrijk. And in Mechelen, I, um, um, I put there a camera sign, and that's, uh, that's to say that Mechelen has a lot of ANPR cameras in the city, over 100. And uh, one of the objectives there, when, when we start working with the city, is to visualize all that ANPR data to see uh, how intensive the traffic is in the area. For, for any policy, and especially mobility policy, you need lots of different types of data to make sure that policy is effective and provides a complete overview of the situation. And in our case, uh, we are working with big data, with small data, data that's currently closed, 
some of it is social media because eventually we also want to ask people what they think when we get to the evaluation stage, um, ask people what they think about the implemented measures. Um, so all these different types of data are present in the Polyviso project. And I, I think you will agree that um, it's important for project results to be reusable in the future, not just by the parties involved in the project, but by others who may be interested. And uh, in that respect, metadata plays a crucial role because metadata can, can make your results discoverable by others. And not only metadata is important, but also the actual catalog. Mm -hmm. the, the catalog is important as well. And in, in Polyviso, we are building a catalog so that it's, in, uh, so it's interoperable with the geo portals and open data portals, first and foremost with the, um, uh, uh, with the portals of the cities where our pilots are located, so the, 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 Czech, the Czech one, the, the EC portal, and the geo portal of Flanders region, and ensuring that uh, the data sets, uh, the, the metadata that is going to be interoperable complies with international standards, for example, DCAT and, and GeoDCAT. And another a discovery mechanism that we're experimenting with is uh, something called rich snippets that uh, is popularized or has been popularized by Google. And um, if you enter any word like chocolate cake, for example, you will get a snippet card containing metadata on, on that search term. And therefore, what we'd like to do in the project is to provide ready answers to people who search for um, transport-related queries. So if someone wants to know the situation on Flanders roads in regards to accidents, they would be able to just type that in, and instead of having to click through one, two, or, or however many links to get to the right data set, uh, they would be able to see that as a rich snippet card somewhere on the right-hand side. Uh, so that's, that would be the preferred option uh, for displaying results to users, and the second preferred would be just to have a metadata description if, if, if the data set is not visualized there on the right. And I already approached the end of my presentation, and if, if you can think of any cities that sit on a lot of data uh, but not sure what to do with it, uh, please let us know and we will um, try to help them visualize this data for better policy making. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Emily Kaumberg from the city of Antwerp, and I'm working at the Department of Mobility. I uh, will explain more about uh, smart ways to Antwerp and the challenges we have uh, to create uh, this platform. Um, so, smart ways to Antwerp was created by the challenge that we keep uh, that we need to keep Antwerp. The, or the Antwerp region accessible for all the roadworks we have planned in the future and now. Uh, so um, we try to do this with a model shift, a mental shift and a time shift. And um, uh, to, uh, 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 <laughs> to try this we have uh, created hard measure measures and soft measures. For the hard measures uh, we are focusing on uh, real infrastructural uh, impacts like the bicycle bus or new bicycle lanes or for example the, the water bus or the extension of the sharing bicycle system in Antwerp. And for, for uh, soft measurements, we were looking more uh, to see how we can change behavior of our travelers. For example, with the resident approach or with employers uh, approach, or, and that's the last bubble, uh, to give information and online uh, travel advice. Well, um, we started Smart Ways to Antwerp more or less in 2016, so uh, we already have experience with a lot, lot of these measurements. And uh, by doing this, we, um, we uh, discovered more challenges, especially in the last bubble to get information from the travelers, but also to give information to them. So uh, we... Um, 
mapped the ecosystem where we get the troubles about getting this data or getting this information. So we uh, put it in four categories, data from the private sector itself, from uh, shared resources from the government or uh, the regulatory, or uh, data from the user itself. Um, so by these challenges, I especially mean uh, four big challenges we have. Um, on one side, the residents of the inhabitants of Antwerp are still not used to get uh, a camera above their head to get track all the time. It, they still have the feeling that the uh, big brother is watching them, and the people of Antwerp are not that. Uh, um, timid anymore, they have an opinion about a lot of things, especially about uh, roadworks. Uh, then another challenge is uh, to get all the stakeholders together, but also to get the right people and the right data. Um, it's still not for every city or every village possible to get the data open or even share open, um, so that's one um, a big challenge we try to achieve with a lot of meetings and to uh, try to explain why it's important to uh, get some specific data. Uh, the third ch challenge is the standardization of all this data. So especially if we talk about geographic data or data from traffic information systems uh, or even data from new mobility uh, systems, for example, um, now the electrical, uh, the electric uh, step is introduced. Well, there is not uh, something like an international standard to get this data public. Um, and also the regulation is sometimes not up to date. For example, here you can see the shared taxi um, the, or the bike taxi. Uh, this taxi doesn't fall under the law of the regular taxis because it's not electrical and it doesn't have an electrical counter. Um, so this is one uh, part of the challenges we have regarding uh, data and to get the information. On the other hand, um, we collect the data, but then we had to ask ourselves what will we do with this data, because otherwise we collect a lot of data and maybe it's not always relevant. So uh, therefore, uh, we... Um, uh, get the purpose in an overview and it consists about six uh, building blocks and um, they are all first in the inner cir circle. You can see that we uh, try to uh, get this data for internal use, to use by our public author uh, authorities, then to get this data to the partners and at the last step to get this data open for the market so they can use it. Uh, I will go closer to this building block First of all, I will point out the, uh, why we need the data for analysis and ev evolution. So, um, we, for especially for mobility, uh, we have all the project of smart ways to Antwerp, and we also have to prove that it's working. So, we uh, try to uh, manage the evolution of the traffic jams in Antwerp, and we also uh, try to see, and the, these are the, the, the graphs below, um, with the employees em uh, approach, we go to a lot of companies, there we ask uh, the employees to fill in a survey, uh, they have to say with which transport mode they come to, the, to their work, uh, where they are living, and then we can calculate what is the possibility that they don't use a car, but instead use the bike or a shared car system. Um, next, we also uh, introduced an intermodal model, uh, route planner. Um, we are happy to pronounce that it's the first multimodal route planner. Uh, and um, you can ask uh, the question if it's uh, to a city to create a route planner. Not of course, but in this route planner we uh, were able to, to set the parameters for ourselves. So for example, if you go from A to B and it's below the seven kilometers, you only get advice to use a bicycle or to use a multimodal transport. In this Way we try to convince people to use other modes and get them aware of other travel modes they can use. Um, by creating this route planner, we also get more insights in how the mobility data are separate, how they go and how they have to connect with each other. And, uh, 
we try to get all the partners together to give their data and the next step, we don't going to create a mass application. That's something we uh, we are looking for the market to do. But we are uh, we are willing to help the market by getting this data from all the other partners. Um, also, with this mobility data we get from the route planner and also from our users, we can also influence the traffic flow. Uh, for example, now we are working on a project uh, to influence the uh, lighting uh, system of the, the uh, in the city. For example, for bus systems or for uh, important vehicles, and we also are building a parking management system uh, to be able for third parties to sell uh, parking tickets. And uh, last but not least, we um, use the data of our uh, inhabitants, but also for, for our employees, uh, to get the user experience better, to uh, get the, the route from A to B like they need it to be. Uh, but on the other hand, we are looking a lot to data and how we can use it to improve the travel route. But um, it's, sometimes it's more than the data alone. If you have a really bad experience, with, for example, with a route planner, it's possible. Then you use it once and then you, use it, uh, you don't use it anymore because it didn't work like you wish for. So um, we are still aware of that, that it's not only the data we need. We also need the look and feel about the travel from the the travel modes, the transport hubs, and so far. Um, this was my presentation. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, thank you for your attention. First of all, um, I will introduce myself. I'm Ronald Verlaan. I'm working at a consultancy. Uh, this is a consultancy in the, uh, transportation and planning, water management, uh, uh, buildings, and aviation. Um, in this presentation, I'd like to um, uh, tell a little bit about a research we did with a couple of organizations. And this title is very long. So first of all, I will ask you, is somebody familiar with, for example, BIM? Okay. Are people familiar with linked data? Oh, it's getting better. And I think the most of you are familiar with transportation. Yes. And somebody is, has experience with, familiar with asset management. That will be a challenge for me to explain, so hopefully I can uh, keep you going uh, to see to the presentation. But, um, for that, um, I started with this small movie because we did a research program um, is, uh, uh, um, founded by the, the conference of the European Directors of Roads. And we had a two years research with, with uh, uh, companies from, from, from the Netherlands, from Sweden, from uh, uh, Ireland, and from Germany. And um, I show you this uh, small movie, and then I will go further with my presentation, so it gets a bit, little bit clear what are we doing and what are the products we had to deliver for that. Yeah. Exchanging or sharing information about roads between stakeholders in the construction industry across the life cycle of roads is complicated and vital for national road authorities. Road asset managers, contractors, and their suppliers, consultants, and engineers all require information regarding the planning, design, and maintenance phase. Sometimes information about roads is missing or repeated with different values. This leads to inefficiency and additional costs. Computer technology enables us to create a digital twin of the road and its data in the computer. Using linked data and semantic web technology enables computers to link the data and its meaning about the road from different sources to each other allowing them to be fully integrated. How to create a digital twin of the road. Stakeholders in the sector provide structure to their data by breaking down the road into different components. Such components might be roads, pavements, guardrails, lampposts, or lighting. These become object types associated with specific properties in a digital object type library, 
or OTL. It provides the backbone of the digital twin of the road. The data required for managing the road can be structured according to an OTL. This provides an efficient exchange and sharing of information about the road between stakeholders across the life cycle of the road. The Conference of European Directors of Roads, CEDR, initiated a research program in 2015 to create test cases for an interlinked network of existing OTLs. Oxtra in Germany, CBNL and RWS OTL in the Netherlands, Coclas in Sweden, SOSI in Norway, and International IFC, based on the same IT design principles and to establish a guide to demonstrate good practice IT modeling and linking principles. Together, this is called the European Road OTL. Another advantage of the European OTL is that IT developers and road asset managers can agree on a standardized IT modeling style. This is because individual IT modeling styles are a barrier for linking possibilities. Standardized IT modeling and linking principles are a crucial part of the European Road OTL. By doing so, road asset managers can benefit from the structured data according to an OTL and its linking possibilities. Working according to these principles is beneficial because various different sources of data can gradually be linked together without harmonizing the whole world of road data at once. CEDR members have an interest in networks of OTLs and linked data semantic web technology to fulfill their operational needs. In the current data landscape, data often becomes tracked in individual software applications and individual OTLs. This is a barrier for data integration. An advantage of the new approach is that it frees the data from its individual application. Because of this, it becomes possible to integrate data from various sources, GIS, BIM, asset management systems, geographical survey, and other legacy systems. Data exchange or sharing between partners becomes more efficient, which leads to fewer failure costs and better affordability of national roads. This approach was developed and demonstrated by Interlink, a consortium of market parties and research institutes focused on this issue. Interlink delivers a roadmap for a seamless transition into an open, available, standardized, integrated European Road OTL framework. The Interlink approach enables European road asset managers to manage their roads more efficiently due to data integration, to resulting in fewer mistakes for everyone leading to more affordable roads across Europe. To find out more about Interlink, visit the website www.roadotl.eu. Um, and and, and this, this morning also, um, in, in the plenary session, uh, there was um, uh, talking about silos, digital trans transitions, human interoperability, um, semantic web, and, and all these terms come back, but also come back in our um, research. And um, well, a, a digital twin has many views. So if we talk about digital twins, that's semantic. And everybody thinks, oh, I know what a digital twin is. But another person thinks different on a digital twins. This is one of our inspiration, how we can deal with this. Because BIM has different uh, way of view of a digital twin than maybe uh, the GIS uh, standards. Uh, for that. One of the products was a Euro OTL. And what we uh, try to achieve is that we don't make a new uh, uh, OTL eh, and a new uh, uh, ontology, but we use existing ontologies and existing standards like OGC standard and like also Inspire for the network and the national standards to combine them to a core OTL. I have to do maybe like this. Um, the core OTL has some blocks with the standard of how you can deal with metadata, with location, time, and quantity, and units. And then the core is based for transport network, the Inspire network, and the road network, and the asset of the life cycle. Um, to prove that what we did in our research, we did a use case in Germany, a use case in Norway, Sweden, and one in the Netherlands. And I briefly give a small overview about the Dutch case. And the Dutch case was about the needs of the function of the road network. 
and we took lighting. And um, if we look to the, what is the function of a road network, then it's the maintaining of the flow of the traffic. That's the most important thing. And you had a nice presentation about that to, to give insights of, of uh, 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 traffic and also, um, uh, I know where she is, but yeah, over there, yeah. Um, so that's nice because you're, you, that's, that's what's really happening outside, but it has to be maintained. And um, for maintaining this, while we're providing safety for the road users, eh, this, we, we do it for something. So if we have light, where, wherefore we do have light, we have, and we have uh, uh, the safety on the network, but also what's the impact on the environment. And so the function of lighting is providing lighting of, for a road user and also for maintaining. So that's more what it is. It's about the function, but there are also a lot of data needs, locations, uh, properties and relations like quantity. What is what about a height of uh, a lighting? You can have three or four different ways for measure a height from a, a purpose for a function. Um, what's the maintaining conditions for inspections? What are the remaining life cycle of an asset? And also what's the relation to the transport and the road networks, also cross-border. How can linked data help in this use case? To be, or at this time, this time we have many systems. We try to collect a lot of information. We keep it in silos. We try to exchange it, um, but there's a lack of uh, hand over information, uh, the communication can be poor, and also the performance. In this morning, they said also, we, have, we need accurate data, real-time data, how we can achieve that. The to-be situation can act well and available, available, and online in the network, and also being open and not a vendor locking. So, the SS Process asset management um, at this time is, and I will show you, is that um, there are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of contractors working on the same network and they work all in uh, uh, different databases. And for that case, we try to show that if you uh, use linked data, it's better to communicate in the process on a, more or less a data hub where you can link all the data together, but also you can keep your own system. And for the future, I think you need to be step by step doing a change and transition for linking data and for uh, make structures to uh, 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 interact more with all the stakeholders in the chain because we're working in a chain and um, it's, you can also say we are this morning, eh, we all connect together, and for that, um, we, uh, uh, we demonstrate that what, uh, with a repair app that this is an, um, an S3 software, but can be also all the other software, and it's a mapping software, but we, um, uh, uh, when a stakeholder, a contractor, uh, fill in his inspection data, other people can do with the data. So they um, can see the network, they can see what's happening on the lighting, and they can uh, have access to all the data so other people can see what they can do with it real time and not in two months afterwards when it's happening. So if there is an, uh, a worker for, for 10 times a week repair an, uh, a light, maybe we have to think about what we can do for the future to, uh, to uh, not repair it, but to uh, reconstruct it. And the benefits of that, it's a lot, but um, you have benefits on the asset data, the reuse, the reliability of a, 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 a asset data, the standardization and information management um, that uh, for regular sharing of asset data on the right way, um, that was hopefully in time, just in time. More than in time, yeah. And 
but if you will see more about this project and the research program, you can see go to uh, uh, W uh, Road OTL uh, AU. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you very much. When you said that you work with legacy systems and trying to extract data from them, surely if there are different owners uh, of, of these legacy systems. Did you encounter any problems with, with getting that data for harmonization and integration? How was your experience? Yes, um, it depends on the country. In, in Germany, we had a lot of problems to get the data from uh, the different municipalities uh, and, the, and the, the, the organizations. In the Netherlands, it was quite easy uh, because we are more working in open, uh, uh, with open data. So there are some challenges for that. Um, but I think still um, we proved that even when it's in the closed world, you can use these principles to work with it. I mean, you can still keep it in your own and share it with your uh, customers and with your, uh, with your uh, uh, contractors, but maybe in a closed internet world. Yeah? Kari uh, University of West Bohemia speaking. Uh, I have uh, just a ma minor question to uh, your, you as a first speaker. You mentioned the usage of web processing service somewhere in your slide. Uh, could you say a few details about, about that? Because I didn't ma mention that in the presentation. Yeah, um, yeah. WPS are uh, implementing, wrapping uh, some, algorithm, some algorithms that are implemented uh, based on uh, Apache Spark for um, um, elaborating both uh, topology and, and also indicators uh, related to numbers of uh, uh, bikes or pedestrians. So we defined a list of uh, indicators as requested by, uh, uh, by the mobility agencies and uh, transportation authorities that uh, we involved. And uh, these were uh, implemented uh, using uh, basically Apache Spark and uh, wrapped then by uh, WPS services uh, uh, based on GeoServer. I don't know if I, uh, or I replied, okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, maybe just one last question. Okay, we, we got, we talked about, uh, a lot about uh, mobility data and uh, you also mentioned the aspect of linked uh, open data, uh, which is, as far as I know, uh, quite new and not always that easy concept to, to implement. Uh, it's also, I think, a quite, in, in some ways, uh, a time-consuming effort to, to build linked open data. So can you tell me more about, uh, yeah, how do you have convinced um, the partners in your project to go towards uh, the usage of uh, linked, uh, linked data? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, it, it is still um, difficult to convince the people that linked data can help them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my, my story. Is we have to start it uh, step by step. It's more about linked data um, brings you more to think about your data and what's the meaning of your data and to, to, to talk in one language. Yeah. I think that is more uh, what it can bring than maybe the technical part of it. Um, so that's, yeah, it's still, an, an, uh, uh, we have still a way to go. Yeah. And, and I think also it's still a lot of work to do it, to create the ontologies and to, yeah. to harmonize it. So, but first of all, we have to work together and step by step, and uh, yeah, and, and depends also the, the countries uh, uh, where they are now and where they are in the future. Yeah? Okay. Is that good? Thank you. Anyone, a last question? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, then I would, then I would like you, like, like to thank you all for, um, for attend this, uh, this very nice uh, presentation about uh, mobility. And I also would like uh, especially thank uh, our four speakers uh, for their very uh, clear and interesting presentation. So I thank you and have a nice afternoon.